In case you're wondering, the two people celebrating the joy of being there are Leslie Andrews and Jerry Zast. They're a good segue into our next segment. What draws many of us back there year after year is the fun to be had. So I'd now like to take you on some of our adventures, hiking, cycling, canoeing, canyoneering, swimming, and occasionally having narrow escapes. There is simply no better place for self-propelled, physically energizing travel than southern Utah, especially in the spring and fall. The skies are almost always sunny, the temperatures mild, there are no bugs, and for the most part, no crowds. As well, 80% of southern Utah is public land of one kind or another, with almost all of it accessible to various outdoor pursuits. A mining boom in the 1940s and 50s resulted in exploration roads bulldozed all throughout Canyon Country. But today, these roads, largely abandoned and often impassable to regular vehicles, make up a vast network of trails suitable for mountain bikes. There are great public campgrounds, such as this one in Goblin Valley. But you can also set up your camp just about anywhere that is not a park or somebody's backyard. There are hundreds of what are known as dispersed camping spots out in the desert. As I mentioned earlier, my first trip to Canyon Country was with this overloaded machine, carrying everything I needed to live for a month. Of course, there were times on that trip that were more challenging than others. The Colorado Plateau is a high desert area, averaging around 6,000 feet in altitude. At the higher elevations, there can often be snow in October. Thirty years later, I guess I've grown a little soft, and this is now my vehicle of choice, but same basic idea. With its high clearance, it can get me to all sorts of isolated places where I can set up camp in spectacular surroundings and enjoy the solitude and scenery of the high desert. As well as Jeep roads, there is an ever-increasing number of single tracks designed specifically for mountain bikes and located in the most scenic spots. Here on Thunder Mountain, it feels like riding on top of the world. But they're not always designed to be easy. These routes are specifically meant to offer challenges. There are several places where, with the help of a car shuttle, one can spend all day going downhill. Yes, that's snow in the foreground. We're starting at almost 11,000 feet and going for a vertical drop of more than 5,000 feet. There's no shame in walking down the tricky parts, and it did get warmer as we lost altitude. We would occasionally stop by to say hello to the local residents. One trail, the notorious Slick Rock, is actually marked out in white paint on the rock. But just because it's follow the dots doesn't mean you're not going to take a tumble. This cycling trail is not recommended for those with a fear of heights. If you look closely, you can see the two cyclists at the top, and the destination is the road down below. On occasion, the wind comes up, and you can get caught in a sandstorm, which explains the strange attire of these cyclists trying to protect their faces and eyes. One bicycle trail actually goes under a highway interstate. Note that the bottom of the culvert has been paved for cyclists. One of my favorite ways to enjoy the plateau is to paddle down the Green River on the 200 kilometers before it empties into the Colorado. There are no rapids to speak of, no portages, and great campsites. With a 4 kilometer an hour current, you don't even have to paddle. Accessing the shore is not always easy on the Green River. When the tamarisk thickets don't prevent you from landing, sometimes the mud will. But then, make a virtue out of necessity and have a mud bath. 2,000 people canoe down the Green River every year, so every canoe party must have its own portable toilet which can be rented from outfitters. They are used for solid wastes only 
and the rule is that you have to pee in the river. Women don't like that rule. With only one throne for a party of twelve, sometimes the wait can be excruciating, and on the tenth day of the trip the party can get pretty heavy, not to speak of odoriferous. Since it hardly ever rains in southern Utah, the public facilities come without a roof. But that doesn't mean the locals don't take their issues very seriously. One year we tried a different kind of floating adventure, a houseboat on Lake Powell, the enormous reservoir behind the Glen Canyon Dam. The idea for this trip was to use the houseboat as a base camp while we would hike up side canyons during the day. Among the many misadventures of this trip was the return to the marina across the widest part of Lake Powell. Eighty kilometer an hour winds were whipping up six-foot waves which crashed over our bow and onto the front windows. We then lost one of our two motors. Over the emergency radio we heard that a 21-foot cabin cruiser had just sunk in our immediate vicinity. I handed out the life jackets, and Odette went on prayer duty. Her prayers were answered when the marina sent out an emergency pilot who did a flying leap from a speedboat onto the deck of our houseboat, took over the controls, and brought us safely into port. The hiking possibilities in southern Utah are endless. One of my favorites is to a place called The Wave. It is technically in Arizona, but the trailhead is in Utah. It's ten kilometers out and back with lots of walking in sand. About twenty years ago, a German TV station made a documentary about it, and it was soon overrun with German and other tourists. The BLM had to intervene and imposed strict limits on access. Only twenty people per day are now allowed in. Ten spots can be reserved on the internet six months ahead of time. Every day at midnight, ten reserved spots open up. Within seconds, they're all taken. The other ten spots are handed out by lottery the day before to those who show up at 9 a.m. at the BLM office some 40 kilometers away. In high season, there can be more than a hundred people wanting to go. There were only 18 when I went for my permit, and I got lucky. With only twenty people per day, everyone can enjoy the peace and serenity. Photographers can do their thing in an unhurried way, and are quite courteous in not getting in each other's way. At the end of the afternoon, a park ranger shows up to ensure that people leave the wave in enough time to get back to the trailhead before nightfall. A somewhat more challenging form of hiking involves going up and down slot canyons. There are similarities to caving in that one is immersed deep inside the earth in a completely unique world. Some of the canyons are so narrow that one needs to walk sideways. In this one called Spooky, one can get a back massage at the same time. It's not level walking either, and these are not the kind of hikes one undertakes alone. A helping hand is often required in going over obstacles. A daunting prospect on the way down canyon is jumping into the pools while having no idea how deep they are. The bravest goes first, and the others watch. What do you do when a canyon is entirely filled with water? Why, take your clothes off and walk in. The water never sees the sun, so it's usually very cold. Some canyons have interesting history. Near the top of this one you can see a glint of metal. In 1955 a pickup truck with three people inside went over the rickety bridge spanning the opening. The bridge collapsed and the truck got wedged in the narrow top part of the canyon, killing the three occupants. It took days to get the bodies out, but there was no way they could remove the truck. So they piled rocks on top of it to create a base for the new bridge still in operation today. Taking full advantage of the few places where sunshine penetrates to the bottom of a slot canyon. This is especially welcome after cold water dunkings. 
Another one of my favorite hikes is going down the Perea River Gorge to its junction with one of the deepest slot canyons on the plateau, a distance of 12 kilometers, including four in a very narrow section with no place to hide should a flash flood come along. This was planned as a three-day backpacking trip. There appeared to be some menacing clouds on the horizon, so we checked with the Bureau of Land Management to ensure that it would be safe to go in. No problem, we were assured. A few light showers here and there, but nothing to cause a flash flood. So down the gorge we went, in a place so beautiful and dramatic that progress was considerably slowed by endless photo opportunities. We set up camp 200 meters up Buckskin Gulch from the junction, in a very pleasant spot. It was just a few feet up from the dry creek bottom. Getting water for the spaghetti was a bit of a challenge, and you can be sure that it was well filtered. The entrance to Buckskin Gulch, where we were camped, is right behind Jerry, who's collecting the water. After nightfall, a loud whooshing sound suddenly broke the stillness. Uh-oh. I rushed over to check the creek bed and saw a raging torrent rising rapidly. Flash flood. It looked as if our camp would be flooded within minutes, so we scrambled madly to move everything up to another flat spot on a mound twenty feet up, in pitch darkness, with flashlights in our mouths. Regrettably, there are no photographs of this event. Once we were safely up, the water stopped rising and actually spared our initial spot. Then it started to rain, and it rained all night and into the morning for ten hours non-stop. But when we emerged from our tents to check out the creek, there was no water in it. We walked down to the main channel, expecting to see a river flowing. The pools had filled up, but there was no flow. We were dumbfounded. But we were not about to stick around for the next flash flood, so we decamped as rapidly as possible and made our way back up the Perea. That evening, at the trailhead campground near the river, Denise felt the earth move. We rushed down to the river to witness an enormous volume of water chewing up the banks and ripping down trees. This picture was taken the next morning when the river had already subsided considerably. I shudder to think what might have happened had this flash flood occurred a few hours earlier when we were down in the gorge. The next segment of our return to the Red Wilderness will take us through more self-propelled activities, will look at the abundance of plant and animal life that's to be found in the high desert, and we will discover how some desert features lead a rather precarious existence.